Good afternoon, everyone, and a very warm welcome to you to this session, Individual Leadership for Positive Social Impact, the story of the Palestinian Children's Relief Fund. Um, before I introduce you to our host today, um, Steve Sosebi, I would like to start off briefly by telling you a bit about the University of Manchester. That this is the largest campus-based university in the UK with strategic partnerships and collaborations worldwide. For more than 25 years, the university has been providing transnational education, foregoing strong global partnerships and centres for learning across four continents. Today, the University of Manchester is one of the world's top ranked universities, focusing on quality of teaching, research and social responsibility. In 2006, Alliance Manchester Business School, part of the University of Manchester, was launched in the Middle East to offer the part-time Global MBA programme for working professionals. Since 2017, we have operated as the university's Middle East Centre, representing and supporting the activities of the entire university in the region. We have also expanded our portfolio of part-time programmes to include dynamic and flexible portfolio of specialist master programs in educational leadership and practice, real estate and reliability engineering and asset management. And our pipeline of new programs looks equally exciting and dynamic with programs of financial management and international fashion marketing. Today, the Middle East Centre has supported more than 2,800 part-time MBA students we are working professionals of 100 nationalities, graduated more than 1,800, and we have developed an active regional alumni community of around 4,500 graduates of the university. I would now like to um, advise a bit about our host today, Mr. Steve Zasebe. Steve is the president and founder of the Palestinian Children's Relief Fund a non-profit, non-political humanitarian organisation focused on providing urgent medical care for sick and injured children and long-term development in the public health se sector in the West Bank and Gaza Strip. He graduated with a BA in International Relations from Kent State University in Ohio and worked as a writer for the Washington Report on Middle East Affairs during the first Intifada before starting PCRF. For the first 30 years of PCRF as the CEO and President, building one of the most effective, efficient and respective organisations in the Middle East. He has three daughters, Dima, Jenna and Leila, and is married to Dr Zina Salman. Thank you very much, Steve. I will hand over to you. Thank you, Helen. Thank you for inviting me and welcome everyone. Happy Ramadan for those who are practicing. And it's a great opportunity and a great privilege for me to tell my story today and hopefully will have an impact and uh, on the whole concept of social, uh, well, individual leadership and our responsibility globally um, to serve uh, and to help those in need and to address areas uh, um, where people are underserved or uh, oppressed in, in some form, whether economically and politically. In the case of Palestine, it's both. Um, I'd like to tell you a little bit about my, my story because as Helen mentioned, I am an American. I'm not Palestinian, I'm not Arab, I'm not from the Middle East. Uh, however, I've spent the last 30 plus years working and living uh, in the Middle East and um, building an organization that serves that region specifically. And my interest in my uh, focus on the Middle East and particularly on Palestine uh, came about when I was at the university myself. And I'd like to go ahead and share my presentation so I can go through my story and hopefully uh, give you guys a little bit of an understanding of, um, of how I got started. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my content. Sorry about, the, sorry about that. Um, my finger over this camera there, one second. Okay, so let me just go through this process here of, okay. So um, if you guys can see my screen correctly, um, this organization that I founded is called the Palestine Children's Relief Fund. And um, it was founded 30 years ago. Actually, this is our 30th year. 
And uh, I started it when I was a young guy. And actually my story began when uh, I was at the university and I had never met a Palestinian in my life. I'd never been to Palestine, but it was the first intifada as Helen mentioned. And I wrote an article for the school newspaper. Uh, of, I was a student of political science and international relations. So I went ahead. I was very concerned and very interested in the Middle East, just from a student's perspective of studying that region and trying to understand it politically. Why was there a conflict? What was the source of the conflict? And what I realized early on uh, studying the issue and um, at, from a student with an open mind and not having any uh, personal attachments to that region, that the Palestinians life under occupation, uh, their uprooting from their homeland, their denial of equality and freedom in their own country was the main source of the conflict. That was the source of the Intifada. And I wrote an article called Freedom Was the Only Answer for the Palestinian Unrest, meaning that they had to have their equal rights in the West Bank and Gaza and for those refugees who were dispossessed from their homeland. Um, this was just a school newspaper, so it wasn't really a big deal, but it caused quite a lot of uh, debate and a lot of uh, back and forth in the paper with some students who were on the other side of the issue. And what happened actually was that a group of Palestinian and Arab students, kids, uh, students from all over the Middle East who were attending Kent State, my university, reached out to me and wanted to, to find out who I was. They didn't know me. I didn't know them. And they wanted to know who was this American guy writing on their behalf uh, about this issue. So uh, I met with a bunch of students from Palestine, from Egypt, from Bahrain, from uh, Lebanon and Syria. And we discussed, uh, you know, I also believe in being active. I believe there's a responsibility, a moral responsibility, a social responsibility in serving uh, issues and serving people who are oppressed and who are denied equality. My parents raised me that way. So I also believed it wasn't enough to just write in the newspaper. I believed that I also had to act. And we got together, me and these students, and we decided during the first intifada that as Palestinians every day were being killed and imprisoned and beaten and deported from their homeland, that we would start to try to educate American students for a couple of reasons. First, students should always be aware of what the realities and the truth are of the world around them, but also because uh, Americans are paying for this occupation. It comes from our tax money. That money could go to schools, could go to infrastructure, infrastructure, could go to social justice issues in the U.S. or in other countries, not against foreign aid, but it was going in instead towards uh, the occupation of the Palestinians to supporting the military might of the Israeli state, which was controlling the Palestinians by force and denying them freedom and denying them the basic values that the United States was founded on, freedom, equality, and so on. So I believed very strongly that I had to act. So I went back to Palestine. I was actually chosen to go on a student delegation after I wrote this article. And I saw for the first time in my life, um, uh, uh, firsthand, I saw in the West Bank and Gaza in December of 1988, uh, what life was like for Palestinians. And I went back to university, got my degree. I was very much motivated and very much moved by what I'd seen uh, on the ground in the West Bank uh, during the Intifada. Uh, I saw two things, actually. I saw how oppressive and how brutal the military occupation against the Palestinians was. And I also saw the courage and dignity of the Palestinian people and their ability to stay human despite it dehumanizing uh, occupation, which was every day treating their children and treating and denying them their equal rights and freedom on their own land. And when I went back to work as a writer, I wanted to share those stories. As Helen mentioned, I wrote for the Washington Report on Middle East Affairs. I wrote for a Fudger newspaper, an English newspaper in East Jerusalem. I wrote for uh, the Arab American News. I wrote for whoever I could. Of course, this was before the in, uh, internet. So, uh, Communication at that time was a little different than it is today, uh, but I did my best and I tried to share stories of uh, everyday life in Palestine. And in the course of my work, uh, one day I went to the hospital and I heard about this boy from the West Bank who had lost his legs and lost his hand from an Israeli bomb. He was only 12 years old. And I befriended him. I took this photograph of him and I became friends with him. He was very cute, had a lot of positive spirit despite being maimed in a triple amputee. And um, like I said before, I also believe it's not enough to just write or talk about issues. You have to also act on them. Um, it's good to be aware. Uh, hello, Steve. I think you have your voice has just muted ever so slightly there. I just 
Can you, can you hear me? Um, we just okay. went. I don't, to, I don't know yeah. how. I don't yeah, know how I got they, muted. They I have no are, idea. <laughs> Sorry about that. We can hear I did not mute myself. <laughs> Thank you. Steve. I apologize. Where did I let off? Where was it? The last thing you heard. You were saying that you had met this young young boy. Yeah. So I met this boy who was a triple amputee, twelve years old, very cute. He had been eating lunch with his family, and the Israeli army threw a bomb at them, and it exploded, and he lost, as you can see in this photograph, both his legs and his hand. And I felt very strongly as I do today. And please, once again, Helen or Hebe, let me know if my voice goes out. I don't have no idea what happened, but this is the life of Zoom. Sorry about that. Um, so I met this boy and I believe very strongly, as I mentioned before, when I got active at my university uh, after writing that article about Palestinian freedom, that we have to be more than just communicative and aware of issues. We also have to act on them. And that's where leadership comes and that's where social impact comes. Um, communication is essential in this world today, but action also is even more essential. Um, there's limits in communication. You reach the wall uh, of those limits uh, sometimes and we need to go beyond them. So I became, I wanted to help this boy. I met him in a hospital. He was uh, living a life in a wheelchair, uh, but he needed legs. And I wanted to help him get those legs so he could walk and go back to school and try to have a more independent life and not to be uh, depending on people to carry him around and, and to be stuck in a wheelchair. So I went back to Ohio where I am from. Uh, I used to actually have to work in the summertime as a landscaper to save money and go work as a journalist in Palestine during the winter uh, because it was not uh, I was not able to survive as a journalist solely at that time. Um, but when I went back to Ohio, I contacted a Lebanese surgeon and asked him if he would help me to arrange treatment or if he would help arrange treatment for this boy, I would bring him over if I could. And uh, this doctor was very proud, as many Arabs were, uh, of the Palestinian resistance and the uprising, the courage that the people there were showing and wanted to help. So within a day, he had contacted all of his fellow uh, doctors in the community and arranged treatment for him. And I went back and brought this brother and sister over in May of uh, 1990. And they were on the front page of the newspaper. And it was the first two injured Palestinians to ever come to the United States for treatment. Um, and I was just 23, 24 years old, bringing these kids over. And they were on the front page of the newspaper. They were on the television news. And it was a big story. Uh, and it was what I wanted to do as a journalist. I, I wasn't becoming a journalist as a career. I was becoming a journalist as an activist. And I wanted to share my, uh, the story of the Palestinians as a way to sh educate Americans, as I mentioned before. So having these kids on the front page of the newspaper was a huge accomplishment. It humanized the Palestinians who had been dehumanized in the media, in the American media. Um, it also uh, uh, helped to organize the Arab community uh, in our area to help take care of them and to support them. Uh, they came without their parents. Um, and also, it, you know, as I think as an individual, it gave me a purpose and a focus in my life, uh, spiritually and uh, professionally, um, doing something good for others and also serving a cause I believe in, the Palestinian cause, and helping kids who needed help individually to have a better life, to walk again, where all of those were great accomplishments uh, uh, of, this, of these two kids coming and getting treatment. Well, I took them after a few months of treatment, I took them back home again. They had their treatment, him and his sister, his sister had been injured in her legs as well. She had surgery. Both of them returned home walking and uh, better um, than they came and people heard about them. And I thought I was done. I thought I did my contribution and I had served uh, these kids and done my good deed. Um, but when I went back home, people came to me with other children who needed help. And they'd heard about these kids who went to America for free medical care. And they started bringing me other children who needed medical treatment. And I thought that's something I could do to help um, other kids and to do something more for the Palestinian people who I admired and respect very much. And so I started placing these kids in hospitals all over the United States for free and started an organization, as I mentioned before, called the Palestine Children's Relief Fund. And the intention was to facilitate these kids coming over and getting treatment and, um, and to uh, help organize the Palestinian and Arab community in the United States and to educate Americans about what was happening on the ground there. So I found that American hospitals would treat our kids for free. It just was a matter of facilitating their care. And when I started PCRF, uh, it enabled um, uh, uh, us to bring a lot of kids over and during the early years of starting this organization, um, 
I was in Jerusalem one day and I met uh, this beautiful woman who was a social worker for the YMCA who did the same thing. She was um, taking care of kids uh, who were injured in the Intifada and she heard about an American guy sending them to the US and wanted to meet me to see if I could help some of the children she was responsible for as a social worker. Uh, we met, we fell in love, we got married in Ramallah during the first intifada i would think i'm the first american guy to marry a palestinian woman in palestine and um her name was huda al masri and for 17 years we worked together she would take care of the kids she would take care of their social needs uh you know all of the cultural aspects of bringing kids to the united states which is such a different country than palestine of course with the language and food and culture um we would she would take care of that aspect i would take care of running the organization arranging the treatment with doctors fundraising and so on and as a team for 17 years we built the organization and and really made it very um impactful and successful uh, and during that course of time the internet happened we were able to grow the organization based on instantaneous communication and the ability to share information that uh, enabled us to grow and and strengthen our communications throughout the world um, so really things were going well for the organization until one day in dubai um, and we worked together as you can see she was very very much uh, dedicated and hardworking, and a great humanitarian and a great uh, woman and a great wife uh, so for those 17 years we worked together um, to build the organization and to make it impactful and to help as many kids as we possibly could and we started taking on other projects we started sending doctors there to work in uh, local hospitals in palestine to treat children there they were volunteers we started um, humanitarian projects, sponsoring kids who needed sponsorship and so on and so forth. And the organization began to grow and began to have a bigger impact than I ever imagined in my life. Until one day my wife was diagnosed with uh, leukemia. We were in Dubai actually on Christmas day of 2008 with a bunch of kids we'd sent there for medical care. And she was feeling sick and uh, went and got a blood test and uh, found out that she had uh, had leukemia. We went back to the U.S. She began her treatment, and um, and um, you know, within seven months, unfortunately, she passed away. And and as Helen mentioned, I had two daughters with her at that time, Dima and Jenna. Jenna was only two years old, two and a half years old. So it was, as you can imagine, a tremendous and huge shock uh, um, to us as a family, to me as a man. I loved my wife very much, and we were a very happy family. So that, you know, was. A, a tremendous blow and I think in life you face these everybody does everybody faces different kind of challenges and circumstances in their life that they have to deal with whether it's their your own health issues whether it's that of a loved one whether it's a personal crisis of some kind and we all have to make a decision in our life how we deal with this adversity and these challenges um, even when they're as terrible as, as losing your wife and having a young two young daughters to raise uh, what I did is I moved back to Palestine uh, with my daughters uh, who were Palestinian citizens and uh, just focused my energy and my grief and my uh, time into building the organization even more and one of the ways we did that was um, we built a cancer hospital uh, in Huda's name uh, in Bethlehem because she died from cancer and then cancer in Palestine for children was non-existent. All treatment was outside of the West Bank. So we wanted to honor her legacy as a humanitarian and as a Palestinian woman, but at the same time, we wanted to um, help kids there get treatment and to grow the organization uh, is one way to do that. So um, we opened a cancer department in 2013 for children in the West Bank under the name of Huda, the Huda Al Masri Pediatric Cancer Department in Bethlehem. And hundreds of children have gone through that department and been treated for free at a high level of quality care. And all of this was privately uh, done. Uh, all of the money for this department uh, was raised through private donations. And a lot of it came from Dubai, for example. We ran the Dubai Marathon. We climbed Kilimanjaro. We had a lot of fundraising activities. We had to get creative to raise money, uh, but we were very proud that it was all from individuals. And we didn't get any government funding. We didn't get any corporate funding. It was just individuals who gave either a small amount or a large amount to build this department and put his name. And that department exists today. If you have a chance to visit Palestine after COVID or um, in any circumstances, please let me know you can come and visit and see the kids there and see the accomplishment and um, 
and it is for me my greatest professional accomplishment in life is to honor my first wife who I was married to for 17 years and to honor her legacy as a humanitarian, as a proud Arab woman, as a proud Palestinian. Um, so I'm, I'm very honored to, to have done that in my life. Well, as the organization grew, we, we had to build a cancer department in Gaza for children uh, because a lot of these kids in Gaza, as you might know, are stuck there. They're not able to leave and travel freely. Um, so we wanted to ensure that these kids got treatment. So two years ago, we opened a new cancer department in Gaza and even bigger than the one we opened in Huda's name. And this department uh, is amazing. Again, privately funded, completely out of the goodwill and support of people like yourself, who is over a $3 million project. But again, uh, something we were able to raise through different kinds of fundraising activities and really a great accomplishment and an amazing uh, uh, project. And we do lots of other different kinds of projects in addition to sending medical teams there and sending kids out for medical care. We've sent over 2000 children out for free treatment. Uh, we do a lot of different types of programs and projects we have in Gaza. Uh, and this is how the organization has grown and expanded. We have a program for kids who are amputees. We provide them mental health, we provide them medical care, rehabilitation, new prosthetic legs. Um, they're very, you know, these kids, a lot of them are gunshot injuries, snipers, who Israeli soldiers who've shot them during demonstrations or during, for no reason, actually, in many cases. And these kids, we want to get them walking again, make them independent, give them a chance to go to school and have a future. And the first step in that is uh, dealing with their physical injuries and also the mental health issues that I mentioned before. And the organization has continued to grow as well. We're taking on bigger infrastructure projects. What we're trying to do is balance the urgent needs of kids. And by the way, we don't only work in Palestine. We work in the refugee camps in Lebanon. If you follow us on social media, you'll see that this week we're doing a huge food distribution for refugees in Lebanon, in the camps in Lebanon, Syrian and Palestinian. We provide surgery for Syrian refugees, for Iraqi kids, for even Yemeni children. Whenever we can help these kids, whenever we have the opportunity to support them with medical treatment and humanitarian aid, we do that. So we, we provide humanitarian support for those who are in need urgently as a result of the COVID crisis or war or poverty or whatever reason. And in addition to that, we're focusing on the long-term development in the health sector because in the Palestinian health system, for example, they depend on treatment, particularly in Israel for their children and for their patients, which costs lots of money, money that leaves the economy and leaves the health system and doesn't come back. And what we want is to build a more sustainable and independent health system where the Palestinians can treat their own children and their own patients in their own hospitals and save millions of dollars and also save the hardship of families being separated and children having to go for treatment away from their parents and away from their families. So here's some of the two projects we're building right now in the West Bank. One is a pediatric intensive care unit. The other is a pediatric cardiology department because those services are in low supply and are underfunded there. Uh, and that's the type of projects we're taking on. We're balancing the long-term sustainable development with the urgent humanitarian uh, needs of children by sending medical teams there, by bringing kids out, by doing a variety of different projects on the ground there, like I mentioned before, and then the long-term sustainable development. Um, and by, by the way, you know, we're very proud that we're uh, working on the ground in the UAE. I know, um, I think Hibba's in Dubai and some of you are located in the UAE and in the Gulf area. We've been, I've been going to the Gulf for 25 years now. We've been sending children there for treatment. And we've been, uh, I even received an award last year from Sheikh Mohammed for my humanitarian work and very proud of that award. But most importantly, because this is an award for our organization and for so many thousands of volunteers all over the world who make our work possible. And that's what I'm most proud of in this organization is that we're a volunteer organization and that gives people like yourself an opportunity to be involved. You don't have to be a doctor. Um, you don't have to be a nurse. You can be a, uh, someone from any background who wants to be involved and wants to help. And whatever your skill set is, whatever your uh, area of expertise or your interests are, there's a place for you in our organization. So that's really um, the main focus and the main uh, uh, accomplishment of this organization is it gives humanitarian people or people who care about this cause uh, a chance to be involved because we all feel frustrated by the continued denial of the Palestinian people, their freedom and their rights. As you see today in Jerusalem, what's happening 
and how um, people are being evicted from their homes and, and, uh, and what's happening in that city, the ethnic cleansing that's going on there. We're very frustrated by that. And the role that we can play to help people there is there are ways to do a, have a positive impact, to make a social impact on the ground there in a positive way that's not political is to continue to build up health services and provide children and pay people there the humanitarian aid they need. So I wanna show you a little video of what we did, what we did during COVID because um, this has been, uh, as you can imagine, a very challenging year for everyone. And, um, and I hope all of you, despite all of the issues that have come up in the past 15 months have been safe. And, um, and I would like to show you that our organization, despite having been impacted by COVID, obviously we can't send doctors there and we can't bring kids out due to the restrictions on movement, we are still working. So here's a short video of our work in 2020. Twenty was one of the most challenging years in PCRF's 30-year history. In the first quarter of the year, we continued our volunteer medical missions to the Middle East with 20 surgery and assessment teams over three. Sorry. 300 patients in local hospitals before the COVID-19 pandemic shut down travel. We had several injured children being treated for free outside of Palestine when COVID-19 prevented us from sending more kids for free care. In March 2020, when the COVID-19 virus erupted in the Middle East, we focused our main relief efforts towards providing urgent humanitarian relief for at-risk communities. These included providing medical equipment, testing kits, PPE, and other urgent medical aid for public and NGO hospitals to help them respond to the crisis. PCRF provided thousands of families facing extreme poverty and hunger in refugee camps and marginalized communities throughout the region with food, PPE, infection control supplies, and other humanitarian aid to help them survive the crisis. In 2020, we continued to provide hundreds of orphans in Gaza sponsorship to meet their basic needs. PCRF provides hundreds of children monthly sponsorship through the generous support of donors all over the world, including Syrian refugees in Gaza. Our Gaza Amputee Project is the only one in the world that is providing social, mental and physical support for all of Gaza's kids who are suffering from the loss of limbs. Our Gaza Mental Health Program provides therapy and counseling to both the children and their families where the children are being treated for cancer and who are in our amputee program. In 2013, PCRF opened the first and only public pediatric oncology department in Beit Jala Hospital in the West Bank town of Bethlehem. Named after Hud al-Masri, our former head social worker who, for 17 years, helped to build PCRF, the department has provided hundreds of children free cancer care with a high level of success. In 2019, PCRF opened the Dr. Musa and Suheila Nasser Pediatric Cancer Department in the Gaza Strip. Named after two volunteers who helped to get PCRF started in the early 1990s, the department ensures that children with cancer receive the care and treatment that they need and deserve. In 2020, the Mohammed Zaman Akil Pediatric Intensive Care Unit is a soon-to-be-open 14-bed department being built in cooperation with the Kuwait Red Crescent and the Welfare Fund Ta'awan. Also being built on top of the PICU is the Ahmed Abu Ghazella Pediatric Cardiology Department, which will include a new catheterization laboratory. This new department will provide sick children pediatric cardiac surgery in the West Bank. Both of these two departments are at the Palestine Medical Complex in Ramallah.
IRF is a grassroots, non-political, non-religious humanitarian organization founded with the idea that every person can contribute to our mission any way they can. Our hundreds of chapter members and volunteers all over the world continued in 2020 to support our work, even while COVID-19 canceled many of our benefit events and fundraisers. Thanks to our volunteers and supporters, we continue to achieve great milestones in the healing of children in the Middle East in the most efficient and effective way. That milestone is best reflected in our ninth straight four-star rating from Charity Navigator in 2020, which ensures that PCRF is using our donations in the most efficient and transparent way possible. Our goal in 2021 is to continue to respond to the humanitarian needs of children in the Middle East, as well as to address areas in the public health sector that build sustainable and independent health services. We thank all of our volunteers, donors, sponsors, and supporters who enabled 2020 to be one of our most productive and impactful years ever. So that is our work in 2020. Let me stop sharing my screen here. So that was our work in 2020. And um, as you can see, despite the COVID, uh, despite the, despite the COVID uh, outbreak, we were still able to respond to what's happening on the ground in Palestine, uh, in Lebanon, in Jordan, and for Syrian refugees. Um, and that's pretty much my presentation. Uh, the last 30 years have been a crazy time in life for me, as you can imagine, not a usual kind of life for somebody from Ohio, but one that has given me great, uh, um, let's just say meaning and purpose in my life. Being able to do something for the Palestinian people has gotten me through uh, the loss of my first wife. I've since remarried as, as Helen mentioned uh, to a pediatric oncologist, a doctor who treats kids with cancer, ironically, um, Dr. Zina Salman, and she volunteers with our organization and helps kids as well. So. My life has gone full circle. Uh, I've been very privileged in my life to be able to do this work and to find it such great meaning and purpose. And also to work with so many thousands of volunteers all over the world. We have doctors and we have people who support us from as far away as Japan and New Zealand and Chile, uh, the other side of the world and people every day who give from their time and from their energy to support our work and make our work possible. And that's given me great uh, purpose and great uh, satisfaction in my life. So thank you all for giving me this chance. Uh, Hiba and Helen, thank you. And um, I'm happy to answer any questions if you have some. Thank you so much, Steve. Um, yeah. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, really, that's very inspiring. I mean, the yes, journey, the story, everything. And it's also worth mentioning that, you know, one, we care so much. The University of Man Manchester has one of the strategic goals is social responsibility. The three strategic goals are teaching, research, and social responsibility. And you know, this year we have been named number one um, by the uh, Times uh, rankings for social impact. So the Times Higher Education, the, the impact rankings 2021, the University of Manchester has been named number one. We care so much about social impact, about giving back. Uh, we support so many initiatives and we were very pleased to have you with us today to share your story, to share um, the story of the PCRF, which a lot of people don't know yeah. and have a lot of misconceptions about. So today we would like to thank you and we would like to invite everyone to, I mean, support yeah. this great cause, go visit yes, social media, absolutely. visit the website, learn more, see how you can be part of this change, be part of this initiative. I mean, I personally, I'm going to do that. Mm -hmm. And I would like to invite everyone to do this today. So yes. if you have any questions for uh, Steve, please go ahead. We still have some time. Yeah. Uh, if and you want to know more details. Steve, could you just explain a bit, if you could, about how our students, alumni and you know, community members could volunteer, become sponsors, supporters of the organization? 
Sure. So we are a volunteer organization, as I mentioned before. We have chapters all over the world, and these chapters are people coming together, organizing together in their local communities to support our work, either by taking care of children that we send to the, their area for treatment. Mm -hmm. Um, and we hope to expand in this area once COVID is over, we can start sending kids out again for treatment. In addition to that, these chapters ha have events in which they reach into their communities and raise the resources that we need to build cancer departments, to build intensive care units, to make our organization successful on the ground in Palestine or in Lebanon. Um, it depends on volunteers who uh, you know, give us the opportunity to do our work. So. If you want to start a chapter in your area, or if you want to join a chapter, if we have one where you're at, please reach out to us through our website, which is pcrf.net. If you want to volunteer in other ways, uh, you have some ideas. We do all kinds of different types of activities. There's a, we work with Cycling for Gaza, for example, who every year uh, cyclists ride for a few days to raise money and awareness to support projects in Gaza. We have, mm -hmm. uh, we work with Team Palestine, which is a group that runs marathons all over the world to raise money for our work. And if you have your own ideas or your own initiatives that you want to start, we have a peer to peer fundraising opportunity, which means you can uh, go to our website and set up a fundraising page and share it with your friends and uh, pick a particular project you want to raise money for amputees, kids with cancer whatever that might be, uh, we're, we give you that opportunity to set that up on social media and share that link and people can donate that way for your birthday, for your wedding, for a loved one. Um, so there's lots of opportunities to get involved. Uh, just reach out to us if you have any questions. My email is steve at pcrf.net. I'm happy to hear from you if you uh, have any questions specifically for me um, that you don't want to share or you want to ask here. Uh, just let me know. Thank you so much, Steve. I mean, sure. Just to, if I, a question that I can ask you, 2020 was obviously very challenging for yourself and the organization mm -hmm. and indeed everyone. But initially when you were setting up the organization, did you have any challenges that you faced that you know that you have now, when you look back, you know, that you were, that you have overcome? You know, if you could just explain a bit about that. I mean, the hardest part, thank you, Helen, the hardest part of uh, any organization is getting started and then yeah. sustaining success. Uh, you have to keep your drive, you have to keep your passion. And that's really a huge, huge challenge over years as well. Um, but getting started at the beginning was uh, obviously nobody knew who we were. Nobody believed in our mission. Nobody believed in me because here's an American right. guy who's helping Palestinians. Americans yeah. are not usually those people uh, when it comes to Palestine. So I had to prove myself over and over again to overcome a lot of suspicion or just mistrust that people had about who I was or what we could accomplish. And that constantly meant I had to prove over and yeah. over again my sincerity and my um, honesty and my dedication to this cause. And I did that. It just took time. Um, so really, I mean, while there's always going to be challenges when it comes to having the resources to do the work that you want to do, the biggest challenge for me probably was just having to prove myself over and over and over again. And, um, and I'm I, actually, I don't mind that because it forced me to keep active and drive that, keep yeah. that drive going. Um, but I think the main, you know, not to be uh, despondent or to be frustrated or to give up at the beginning because you're always going to face challenges you're always going to face uh, failure um, but if you believe in what you're doing and you and you believe in your mission you can accomplish that absolutely and so. where where do you see the organization being you know in a year's time a few years time like you know you're building the hospital and you know where do you see everything going like where what is the kind of yeah. goal of the future so I think our mission is in the future is to continue to address the two areas that I mentioned before, which is the urgent humanitarian relief. There's yeah. going to be a continuous uh, challenge on the ground in, in the Middle East for children, in particular refugee kids and conflicts. I mean, the, unfortunately, the, the source of conflict that I wrote about over 30 years ago still exists today. So that's going to continue to produce these humanitarian crises that organizations like ours have to respond to. But really, our main focus is to have a bigger impact in the health sector by focusing on areas where there's defects, where the mm -hmm. Palestinian health system doesn't have services available for the local population, and try to fill those defects by uh, providing the infrastructure and materials and also the human resources and training to ensure that there is sufficient development that meets the needs in the health sector of the Palestinian population. Mm -hmm. And that's obviously a huge, huge 
amount, uh, effort because we're talking about um, a health system that is significantly underdeveloped, doesn't have mm. resources, doesn't have a system in place, mm. is under military occupation or in the case of Gaza under siege. And that makes it doubly difficult to really have a tremendous mm -hmm. impact. But we're focused on that. And we have lots of people involved mm -hmm. to support that as well. Thank you so much. Just before I open the, the, the platform to any other questions, um, some of the, the children that you know were in the video would now be perhaps teenagers, adults themselves. Do mm -hmm. they still have contact with them? You know, and do they tell their story like how like how they have them developed over the years? Like, you know, like what what has happened to them? Yeah. Yeah, so we've helped thousands of kids. Uh, we've sent over 2,000 kids out for medical treatment. We've treated tens of thousands through our medical missions mm. going there and operating. And each one has their own story. They have their yeah. own name and identity and personality. And uh, But for the first kid in December, I went back. When I was in Palestine in December, I went to Hebron and I visited Mansour, the first child I brought out. And he is a father of four now. He has oh. a child uh, the age of when he was, when he was injured. Um, and I was happy to see that he has as much of a normal life as one can expect for a triple amputee who lives under military yeah. occupation in the West Bank. Uh, but he, he, you know, he had a chance and that's because of our volunteers and because of our people who came forward to help him. So I do try to stay in touch as much as possible with the kids that I particularly house in my own home or have taken care of personally or have established personal relationships with. And some have families now, some are doing very well in their life. And, uh, and that always gives me a great level of satisfaction and accomplishment. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Steve. There is one question from Mustafa. Um, He's, he would like to know when you were initially starting off, how did you overcome the initial adversities of raising funds? Yeah, I mean, well, that was hard. And actually for the first couple of years, we didn't have any resources at all. And, um, and it was uh, a huge challenge uh, for everyone because, uh, you know, a lot of times this costs money to do this work. And, uh, uh, I mean, the key was to just stay persistent and to sacrifice. I mean, mm -hmm. a lot of us uh, uh, just believed in our mission and believed in helping the Palestinian children. So we put aside whatever, uh, um, you know, personal challenge issues were for us and focused on just building the organization. And we believe that over time that we would have the support we need to, to be more successful because it was just people everywhere we went, people responded uh, favorably to um to the work that we're doing. So it was just a matter of being persistent, winning the trust of people and meeting yeah. more and more people who wanted to help and could help. And that took time and yeah. that took a lot of energy and it took a lot of uh, dedication, but because we believed in our mission and we believed what we were doing, we were able to reach that goal and overcome that initial uh, uh, challenge of, of not people not knowing who we were or not supporting us. Thank you so much. So I would now like to open up the, the platform. If you have any questions, please feel free to type them in the chat box. Or if you're, you're happy to, you can unmute yourself and ask Steve directly as well. There's lots of comments saying thank you very much, Steve, for sharing the story. Um, it's very inspiring indeed. It's a, you know, a wonderful story to, to listen to. Um, and I'm sure there will be a lot of um, of our attendees today who would like to to volunteer and you know to to look into the organization more for sure definitely my pleasure so if anyone has any questions please do put them in the chat box or you can unmute yourself as well how big is your team steve and i know that you are kind of between the u.s and and uh, several regions mm -hmm. the yeah East. thank you that's a good question. So because Palestine is such a fragmented country, and then obviously you have Lebanon and Jordan where we have a presence as well, we want to bring, and you know, in Palestine, obviously Gaza's closed. I have employees there. We have 15 employees on the ground in Gaza with three offices because we want to bring the services to the people. We don't want them to have to pass through checkpoints or through settlements or have needs that can't be met because logistically they don't have access to to our organization. So we open offices regionally uh, because Palestine in itself is closed in many areas internally. Um, so we have six offices in the West Bank. We have three in Gaza. They're small satellite offices, but it gives an opportunity for the local communities to reach us and to have access to our services. Um, so we have to answer your question and to build an organization that is now, you know, we, we, we spend 
around $8 million a year, we have around 60 employees between Lebanon, Jordan, the West Bank and Gaza, who are social workers, field workers, uh, the front end of the organization and the back end. If you want to be a successful organization, you also have to take care of the administrative aspects, the accounting, uh, the procurement, um, all of those things that, uh, you know, you have to show donors, you have to show governments that you're accounting for all of the money that you have and how you're spending it and making sure it's done efficiently and done legally. Um, we have to have a team on the ground for that. So we have around 60 employees throughout all of the Middle East. And um, we're very proud that uh, these are mostly, uh, almost all of them Palestinian or Arab who are working very hard and giving their time and their energy to serve their people and their cause. Thank you so much, Steve. Uh, mm -hmm. There is a question from Yasmin. She is asking, what do you feel is your biggest accomplishment so far? What are you most proud of? Well, I mentioned earlier, the biggest accomplishment was opening a cancer department in my first wife's name. Uh, Huda Al Masri. Um, that was really our first big project outside of sending kids for treatment and bringing doctors in to treat kids. Um, and most importantly, it was a huge accomplishment because it gave me a chance to carry on and honor her legacy as a humanitarian mm -hmm. and as a great Arab woman and, and uh, Palestinian mother, uh, and to honor her legacy for my children, um, you know, who she died very young and, you know, their memories fade over time. So I wanted to keep that legacy of of who she was um, in their mind. So that's, that was my greatest accomplishment professionally and personally in my life uh, was to honor my wife for Al Masri. And of course, to build an organization that is today, you know, doing such great work. I mean, it started just from that first child and sister, Mansoor and Sabah, the first two kids I brought out before I started PCRF. I never imagined that it would be a life mission and it would grow to be this impactful, but it has. And that's uh, also a, a great, a, a personal and professional accomplishment for me as well. Thank you so much, Steve. Mm -hmm. so if, if anyone has any questions, please do feel free to, to put your question in the chat box or you can unmute yourself as well. Thank you so much. Um, so Steve, um, do you, what you mentioned to, to Hiba a few moments ago that there's you know, the staff of 60. Do you, mm -hmm. do you, do you foresee that increasing? You know, you know, as the years go on, the months go on, um, with more volunteers, no. you know. Well, we have thousands of volunteers yeah. and that's really the, the core uh, element of our success is that we are a volunteer organization and that we are able to maximize the return mm -hmm. on investment. So when, you know, we get treatment for free or doctors go and operate for free mm -hmm. as volunteers, you know, the return on investment is a huge, huge, yeah. uh, children are getting surgery, they're having life-saving uh, operations done at minimal expense. So that's, mm -hmm. uh, that's how we're able to really show our supporters the, that their investment goes a long way. But mm -hmm. I don't see the organization growing too much more in the sense of manpower and human resources. Mm -hmm. The mm -hmm. impact, I think we have in place the structure to have a bigger impact and to implement bigger projects. So I think we're well in place for us for that uh, in the future uh, without taking on too many more uh, staff uh, and perhaps even reducing a little bit as we become more efficient. Um, so um, I think we've, we've reached kind of the, the peak in that regard. Yeah, and in terms of growing PCRF, what, what are the top three things or two things that you think you would need in order to sustain PCRF or to keep it growing even? That's a good question. I think more networking with people all over the world who are looking for organizations that are efficient and effective in places that are neglected or have a huge amount of humanitarian needs. So, you know, we're just, I feel in that sense, we're still very small. I would probably love to know how many of people who are attending this um, Zoom call here today are, were aware of PCR before we started. So my goal is that it should be an organization that every person who cares about the Arab children or cares about Palestine would know of PCRF and would know that this is an organization they can turn to to, um, uh, to see accomplishments and see impactful work being done on the ground. So I think we have a long way to go to reach mm. the number of supporters and people who are aware of who we are. So communication and networking is number one. And number two uh, would be, um, as far as our goal goes, is to bring in more resources to have a bigger impact. So 
you know, in the Middle East in particular, you have a lot of people who have the resources to do more than they're currently doing. So we either need, we need to reach those people and give them the opportunity, whether they're governments or whether they're individuals, to have an impact. And number three is to continue to grow an efficient organization. You know, a lot of times organizations over time can become very bureaucratic or to lose that effectiveness uh, that made them special and made them unique. And I don't want that to happen to PCRF. And we're very concerned mm -hmm. that, um, you know, our work continues to be uh, uh, applied in the most efficient and effective way. Thank you so much, Steve. Sure. Um, Yasmin has actually um, mentioned in the chat box that she came across the organization during the awards ceremony in the UAE. <laughs> Oh, great. Thank you, Yasmin. I'm, <laughs> that, was, that was a year ago. So um, right before COVID, we were actually very fortunate to get that uh, out of the way. But I mean, awards are nice. I mean, it's nice to be recognized. But yeah. more importantly, is that when, um, when these awards are given out, that uh, it's an opportunity to let people know who we are and what we do, because uh, awards mean nothing if you're not able to um, apply uh, your work on the ground and help people in need. So that's really the main focus of, of these kind of awards is just yeah. to add some legitimacy to the organization, uh, but more importantly, to uh, to meet more people and to give more exposure to the work that we do so we can have more support to do more work. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Steve. Mm -hmm. so if anyone has any more questions, please do feel free to unmute yourself or you can type in the chat box. Hi, Steve. This is uh, Samir Abafash from Amman, originally from Gaza, but I live in Amman right, right now. And uh, I work for UNRWA, United Nations, for the you know, Palestinian refugees uh, in the Middle East. Mm -hmm. And I'm just thinking loudly, uh, as I work in finance, is there any plan to, for any works like on partnership, uh, 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 you know, uh, basis with other UN agencies, for example, UNRWA, UNICEF, so you sure. can expand the... Uh, the comms and the approach that you have used, especially when uh, you, you get to know the, the data is available in all those UN agencies and they can help and extend assistance. And I'm happy as well to be a volunteer in your organizations, especially in Amman, you don't have any base. So if, if you think uh, in future, uh, let me know so we can uh, get in touch and uh, maybe provide any, any support for Palestinians in the camps in, in, in Amman and around. Thank you, Samir. Actually, we do have a base in Jordan. We do have an office there. We have a we have a chapter in Jordan. It's one of the few countries where we have an operational office and also a volunteer group. So if you'd like to join our, and we do a lot of work in the camps in Jordan, uh, in Gaza camp and the others, uh, we have a staff on the ground in Amman and in Urbid in the north who are providing services for Syrian and Palestinian and Jordanian children. Um, but to answer your question about uh, UNRWA, we do already work with and cooperate with UNRWA. Uh, we do lots of projects in UNRWA uh, facilities. We open in UNRWA schools, clinics, and uh, rooms for children with special needs. Um, we work with UNRWA on the ground in Gaza uh, to apply our humanitarian services directly to the people there. So we respect and cooperate and appreciate all that UNRWA does and their importance in the Palestinian health system, education system, and then the Palestinian uh, movement. So UNRWA is one of the many organizations that we work with on the ground and cooperate with already, and we uh, will continue to grow and expand. We'll continue to include UNRWA in our work. Thank you very much. Good to know all of these success. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so much, Samir. Um, if anyone has any more questions, we do still have a few moments left. Uh, you may unmute yourself or you can pop your question in the chat box. Um, Steve, I'm sure that, you know, as, as I mentioned, that, that there will be lots of other people who would like to know more, perhaps reach out to you. Um, if it's okay with yourself, perhaps, but if anyone is interested, we can connect them with you um, to yep. allow you to, to make contact with one another. So we will certainly get in touch with you and let you know for sure um, of any details from yep. that side. Thank you, Helen, and thank you, Hiba. And thank I'm always happy so to hear from anybody individually. Um, reach out to me either through um, through your instructors or through directly through our website. And just as a closing kind of comment, uh, I just want to say that uh, you know I think you're all business students, and that's great. I think uh, uh, this is probably a great course to advance your career. But do remember, as you become more successful and established in the business world, 
um, that there is always a responsibility that comes with uh, success in our life is to give back to others and that our success is never based strictly on our abilities or our hard work or our dedication that's required to be successful but mm -hmm. it also is that um, there are so many people who give you opportunities and the societies that we live in have opportunities available to us that other societies don't uh, in the business world and in the private sector so hopefully you guys will continue to be successful in your your personal lives and your professional lives and that you see that uh, success also having some uh, responsibilities to others uh, and to serve uh, humanity in ways that can be uh, life-changing and transformative and I promise you uh, when you get more involved and I'm sure many of you have experienced this already in your lives you'll find the great feeling of satisfaction and accomplishment when you give to others and you help others and you're charitable in your life, uh, you'll find that the more success comes to you and a greater sense of satisfaction and accomplishment comes with that as well. Thank you so much, Steve. There's um, just a, one, one more question, if I, if I may, Steve, is how could we get more info, information about setting up a chapter here in, in Dubai itself? How would we go yeah. about doing that? So go to our website, it has volunteering opportunities. It has uh, links for you to reach out to us and mm -hmm. to um, communicate to us about uh, uh, opportunities for volunteering. So um, please uh, uh, connect uh, through our website, which is pcrf.net. And, uh, and you'll find ways to, um, to volunteer or to set up a chapter. And if you have any questions, if you can't do that, uh, or you're finding that difficult, just reach out to me directly at steve at pcrf.net. That's my first name with our website as, uh, as the email address. And I'll be happy to, uh, uh, to direct you to the right person. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Steve. Thank you you're very welcome. much, Steve. Thank you, everyone, for attending. Thank you very um, much. It was a wonderful session, Steve. Thank you so much again. My, it's um, my pleasure. Take care, everyone. Um, have a lovely afternoon. And please do remember to follow us on our social media channels of LinkedIn, Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram. Take care, everyone, and have a lovely afternoon. Thank you.